So hello back. Product management is a very demanding job, but it's also one of the most rewarding ones. These are not my words, these are Petra Vila's words, and she knows what she's talking about. She actually was a product for a bit of time, let's say not a long time, a bit of time, became discovery coach, and then she wrote a book, a book called Strong Product People. And then since she actually wrote that book for well, three years, she's been helping product teams and product leaders up their game. So instead of doing a classical talk, we decided to do a fireside chat where she would answer my questions about what is it to be a strong product people, how can you become strong product people, and if you're a manager, how can you actually help your managers become strong? So please welcome on stage Petra Fila. Hello. Thank you. Oh, welcome. Now we have to sit on bar stools really gracefully. Exactly. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to take a look at my phone, not because I'm chatting or slacking, just because I have the questions on it, okay? So don't feel like I'm not interested. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask you is that, as I told you, you, you wrote a book called Strong Product People. And what does that mean to be weak product people? Oh, maybe that's something that we need to reframe right away, right? So I, maybe not strong yet product person. Um, I think none of us came weak to the job. We just come from different backgrounds maybe or something like that. Um, and it really highly depends on the context you operate in. I sometimes use this metaphor of when you want to become a photographer, then it's a good question to ask, okay, what type of photographer I want to become? Because there's food photography or sports photography or wildlife photography. And it really depends what um, equipment you need to buy and what skills you need to develop depending on this type of photographer, right? And I think it's similar with product management. Um, so you need to figure out what type of product management is the product management that your company currently needs and the products that you're working with and the people that you're working with. So you need a bit of a blueprint and you can create that yourself, which is very, very hard. Hopefully your line manager has an idea about what makes a strong product person in your organization. Hopefully they can talk about personality traits that people should bring that's what we hire for, and then skills and capabilities that you should build. And hopefully they can help you to build some of these things in coaching situations. And some of you might think, but my line manager is not doing all of that. And I know that this is the case in many, many companies. So you could either encourage them to do this and actively seek their guidance and advice and feedback, or you go build a bit of a support system around you. So peers can give feedback, your teams definitely can give feedback, and there are some frameworks out there, product management assessments that you could use. I created one, I share one in the book, and you can download it in the website. So that helps you to have these conversations about, hey, what do you think skills and capabilities are that I should build? And how do you see me when we look at these things? Where are gaps in my skill set? Okay. Um, I know there's a bias called Dunning-Kruger, when the people that know the least are the most confident in what they know. Hmm? I guess we all met people that thought they knew about what good design was, what good product was, exactly. But it's easy. If I think I'm part of a strong product people, how wrong am I? <laughs> That's a fun question. <laughs> I think there is, I actually see that not being the case that often in product people. Maybe all of us are rather humble or I don't know. Um, it's oftentimes more the, I have to learn more. Bring me more books and more frameworks and I want to do this better and learn from others and all. So I see it more to be the case that product people sometimes 
overdo the consuming bit of learning. And definitely a conference is a lot of intake, right? But then you need to find the time to apply these things and see if they work in your context and need to inspect and adapt um, and try it again. Um, to, and that's really what builds the muscle. And ultimately, and that's actually another cool thing, is if you then contribute to your company's product community and give it back and explain to your peers, hey, I tried this opportunity solution tree thing. I don't get it. Maybe we need to do it together so that it's really helpful because a lot of people love it and use it. And maybe it's just not for you and you need to use, I don't know, user story mapping, right? So I think this contribution back to your internal product community as well as this product community here is something uh, that helps you align. And the ones that are super confident, like you, Fabrice, and think like I'm the best product person on the planet, external feedback always helps, right? Um, so get some validation from peers and your line manager, maybe even an external mentor, um, or maybe even a professional coach or something like that. So external feedback helps to do a bit of a calibration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm ju just bouncing on, on what you said about the fact that you feel as a coach that Product people are more humble than the others. Um, have you any hypothesis about why we are more humble or that's sort of less prone to thinking that we are strong than other professions? It's oftentimes that you're not the most skilled person in the room to do the job. So the developers know a lot about the technologies they're using, right? And they're doing this in a really nice way. And the designers are really good in designing things and making it work and make it in um, sense in the minds of the customers. And product people, we are often kind of this eight-legged creature. So we need to talk to all of the people in the company, make it work. We just heard what Bruce said about stakeholder management and empathy and leaning in and all these kind of things. So I think that is a really humbling experience that we're constantly walking on shaky grounds because let's face it, that's how it often feels to be a product person. You're constantly learning, you're constantly adapting, and the more you learn, the more you have the sensation of, I have no clue what I'm doing. And maybe that is the humbling experience here. I, I, don't, I remember someone say that, I don't remember who, that what was really special in products and say product, product design, etc., is that we need to love being wrong all the time. If you don't, you're not going to do products. Um, what do you think about that sentence? It's totally true, right? I, in the book, for example, talk about personality traits that I think are helpful to have as a product person. Um, and sharing all of them is maybe not that helpful because you either have them or you don't. You can develop personality traits over time a bit, but usually we just come with them once we're grown-ups and adults. And one personality trait that I find really to be helpful is adaptability, because so many things are constantly changing. So we need to be fine with change. And if that is the case, I think, then and, and with saying no a lot. That's another thing that is really hard in product. Yeah. Thank you. You, you use the word in your book, Produktgefühl. I don't speak German, I think. Yeah. It was I had uh, physics, I'll speak in German, but I, I don't. <laughs> um, could you elaborate a little bit about what do you mean by product gifel? Yeah, I think it loosely translates into product sense. Um, and I actually borrowed it or heard it the first time from Sean Russell. Um, and he gave a talk at one of the product tanks in London about this topic ages ago, actually. And he was explaining that learning product management to some extent is a bit like language learning languages, because first of all, you learn the vocabulary, but you cannot speak fluently. Then you speak fluently, but you still find yourself in this awkward social interactions where you said something and everybody's staring at you with blunt faces and like, what was she actually saying? So, and the next level is then really have this sense for the actual language so that you can use it appropriately in any situation. And that is what I, what I talk about when I say product sense or the Produktgefühl. That's what you want to develop. It's a bit of the ultimate state of product management, that you can really navigate the things that you want to do, all the tools that we're having and why you want to use them now and why you don't to use this framework now and all these kind of things. Yeah. Be a bit more playful with things. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, there's something you said right at the beginning, which is linked to this. Um, 
even as a manager, as a product manager, um, I actually sometimes had doubts about some people who wanted to get in the product. And people saying, do you think I have what it needs to become product? Uh, people that are able to doubt, but in a methodical way, OK? Um, and you said, OK, people are not strong yet. Uh, do you think it's possible for anyone to become strong product people? I am not talking about being politically correct here, but being more, do you have to tell to some people that it's not their thing? I base, have I saw anyone who was not able to at some point, the, the question is what is, what makes the competent product person in your organization, right? And that really differs because we have this feature factory, order taking, hierarchy structured, backlog item, maintaining product roles. And then we have the complete op opposite of the empowered product team that is kind of picking their own opportunities to help the strategy to become reality. And this is such a big stretch. Um, and the question is, can everybody be this super empowered product person, having the responsibility for profit and loss, doing forecasting, talking to controlling, talking to sales, figuring all these things out? That's the way harder journey. But I still think you can end up there if you invest in your career time after time after time, and if you pick the right environments to grow. So that, I think, is the biggest pitch here. So really yeah, assess the companies that you're joining and see if they're investing in people. So if they're investing in you to some extent, I think that makes a big difference. And if you have the time to not only consume new things like books and talks and conferences, but also apply these things. Because let's face it, you're slow. The first time you do an opportunity solution tree, that takes time. And then you have to reflect and see if it worked and tweak it. Um, and that's another thing. So if the company is constantly under massive pressure and you cannot take a bit of your time out for personal learning, then maybe it's not the perfect environment to grow. So yeah, ultimately, I think everybody can learn the ropes of product management. Um, if you pick the right environment, if you seek for external feedback, and if you invest some time in your personal growth. Okay. I would just want to ask a question to the audience. How many of you are managers? Just raise your hand. Okay, plenty of people. How many of you are not managers but are dreaming about being managers? Yeah, you shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you should. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. Plenty you of can. other problems. Uh, the product <laughs> manager, you just have the user problems, then you have. Okay, but whatever. I, I have no one who is actually I'm managing here, so I can say that. That's good. Sorry, no problem. <laughs> I did invite them, they want to see, to see me on stage. Um, usually, um, when you become a manager, you're not supposed to be the best one in product. And that could be product management, product design, or whatever. You're supposed to be um, the best one to actually make the other people grow. Uh, does it mean that um, to go from IC to management is when, just like me, your muscles or product matters turns into product fats? <laughs> I think you can actually deliberately, let's put it differently, you can start learning some things that are really helpful when you become a leadership person before you actually make the transition. So what I find really helpful for a lot of my coaches is learning the art of giving feedback and even the radical candid feedback. So if, for example, you're not happy with the performance of somebody and you have to have this really tough love conversation about where you see them, where you see some gaps and how you can help them to close them, right? And that is things that you could start without even having the mandate to line manage people. So I think identify some things that would help you to build leadership skills and muscles before you're actually making the jump. And then as always, it's like becoming a parent. Nothing can prepare you for that. And it's similar with your first leadership role. So you can do some things in preparation, but in the end, you just have to jump at some point. And it definitely helps if you learn some things about what, what does it take um, to be a great leader. And is coaching, for example, my leadership style. So it's not everybody's leadership style. I know it is what most of the product organizations favor as a leadership style. Um, and then you definitely want to wrap your head around what actually, what is coaching all about and how could I be doing it and how could I navigate this 
scale again from giving advice and tell people what to do, to make suggestions, to provide feedback, to just ask thought-provoking questions in the end. And once you can navigate that, I think you're ready for making the jump to some extent. Plus, sorry, there was only the people development part of product leadership, obviously, because there's still the product part and the portfolio, the strategy, the how we are building product, the product operations bit, right? So we're focusing on the people development bit here. So that's why I was just talking about that. Is it so different, actually, to be a product leader versus just being a leader? Because you, usually, I, I don't know about you and about the people that are managers, but I, I have reference books just like Radical Candor, which I like. Yeah. I don't like the title. It's very American. But yeah. And the book uh, is very American, but exactly. it helped me a lot. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the, the framework <laughs> itself is really interesting. Um, so can I actually be a product leader if I'm not a strong product people? Yeah. Yeah. But you, your coaching needs to be different. Um, that is at least my take. So think of a football coach that have, has never played football. It's possible, <laughs> right? You just have to learn a lot about the sports. And I'm still not sure if you're then the best possible football coach. Um, I often get asked, should Scrum Masters be product coaches, internal product coaches, for example? And I say, like, I think they can to some extent, but you all ways need to be aware of where your limitations are in giving feedback to product people. Because if you're not, skill, not a skilled product person becoming a, a line manager, then you maybe want to focus on the asking thought-provoking questions, helping people to gain clarity on a topic, helping them to create a strategy for success, and you won't focus that much on giving advice, helping them with whiteboarding sessions, then maybe you're not kind of capable of that but you still could be coaching them to some extent, at least. In the audience, how many of you have managers who never actually were product managers or product designers? Yeah, okay. Still some. See? There are still some people. Yeah. And do you love it? If your manager, <laughs> imagine that your manager is not seeing you, there's no like or whatever. You, you, you can tell him to me directly on LinkedIn if you don't want your manager to know. But, uh, okay, interesting. <laughs> Oh. Um, so, you talk about be strong, and uh, you can have all the frameworks you want, but it's still it's on paper, okay? Um, my question would be, um, when it comes to products, it's all about making an impact, okay? I feel I'm strong, but yeah. my leadership is not good, the conditions are not good, they are the end, you might think you're strong, but you make no difference. Um, how do I measure my effectiveness as a product people, or how do I manage the effectiveness of the people that I coach as a, as a product leader? That is a super hard question to answer, because one could say a successful product person is a person who is managing a successful product, right? But oftentimes that's not the truth, because maybe currently you're launching things that the person that was working in the role before you actually joined the company has already been planting. So and maybe that's a massive success, so kind of you inheriting all the success. So that's why it's so hard um, to answer. I think it is important that the people line managing product people have a compass for themselves what they think product people should be capable of. And this is more looking at the things they do, the actions they take. So are they mitigating the risk of building the wrong thing? Are they actually working with the teams? Are they helping um, people align? Are they able to provide directional clarity? So where are we headed? So something like this needs to exist in the company, and you want to check in on these things every once in a while. Ultimately, we want to look at the success of the product, yeah, you want to look at the, are we learning? Is this team learning? Are they experimenting? Are they talking to clients maybe? So the, the velocity of them learning things is definitely something you want to look at. And again, you need to compare it to the other teams and your context. Because maybe one team is kind of in hyper growth state and they do a lot of A-B testing and putting out experiments twice a day. Where another team is doing a completely new thing like Isabel was talking about this morning, right? They kind of a startup within the scale up, then maybe they're not pushing out two experiments a day. So absolute measures then help us, 
but you can compare teams and what you think is appropriate in your situation. Um, so I think these two things. So are we learning? Is the product getting better by whatever measures? That's something that the product lead needs to discuss with the product person. And then is are they growing personally? I think this is an important measure as well. So do they reinvest some of their time in their personal learning? And these are the things that I would usually look at. And as I said, it's nothing. You cannot put these things on a dashboard, I'd say. Um, you and I have been organizing conferences uh, for quite a time now. And in plenty of conferences, people are invited because they work at Google or Facebook or whatever. And I've always been a bit doubtful of the fact that you join a company when you have I'd say 100,000 people, and how key are you in the organization when you're presenting a framework you haven't built? Um, but there seems to have, still have in product, maybe in other professions, this kind of shortcut between if you work in Amazon, Google, ergo, you strong product people. Where do you think that comes from, and do you think it's completely wrong, right? Do you not know? Please don't ask that question, Fabrice. Or no, I'm perfectly fine <laughs> answering this question. Happy you're asking it. Um, yeah, I think a lot of these environments are famous for the great product cultures to some extent. And if you really look at these product cultures, they're really different. Um, at least what I can tell from the outside or from some of these companies being my clients. Um, and it's not that they're doing one thing, the magic source thing, differently than any, everybody else, but they have a product culture, and that is some, and by the way, everybody has one, it's just more explicit or it's more implicit, so it's not that we're not having a product culture, but those ones are honing their product culture, and they really make an investment um, that everybody to some extent is aligned on some of these things, right? And they're usually great environments to learn. Um, and they have this inspect and adapt and go back and learn and experiment things so much ingrained into DNA. I think that's what they are more famous to. And that's why often skilled product uh, people come out of these environments. Are they plug and play in your environment? Most likely not, because most of us are working in what I call non-native product environments. Um, so your companies have worked in different ways, maybe in more waterfall, hierarchical, whatever ways. And these companies have never been there to some extent. Um, still, there might be areas where they are still super waterfall. That even happens in these organizations. Um, but in general, um, so it's oftentimes super hard to compare yourself to the people that are coming out of these companies. Um, but still, I think it's super cool that they're sharing all their learnings. And what I find really valuable, and maybe this is something that the product leads could do a bit more, um, sharing your best practices. Because these companies are oftentimes fine with talking about, hey, this is our roadmap. Here is our example roadmap. Now you could take it and use it. Um, and other companies often are really shy about sharing their working items, and I think it would be so beneficial for the community to see more product strategies, actual real product strategies. So I think that's why we're inviting them often, because they're happy to share. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about sharing. Um, I love to ask questions to the audience. First thing first, how many of you have in the organization a community of practice, so a place when you share with other people from your profession on a regular basis. Okay, plenty of people. How many of you are alone, first PM, alone designer, and you are frustrated because you cannot share with other people? Still some. Okay. So you talked in your, in your book about communities of practice. Um, being one of the best drivers of this product musculation, product uh, Giffel, Giffel, yeah? Yeah. Uh, genau. Uh, genau. <laughs> these are the only words genau. I know in, in, in German. Um, what are the biggest challenges, not even to s yeah, start one, but to run one? Because uh, you can say, hey, let's start a community of practice, but then these kind of initiatives tend to die after some time. Yeah. Engagement is running low. Yeah. Uh, what would be the, your best advice when it comes to this? Yeah, maybe I can add why I'm interested in the topic at all. So why is product community practice a topic that I'm interested in? Um, it's because I found 
that whenever a strong line manager is not available helping the product people to grow, what should they do? So they turn to their peers, right? And that alone is a product community of practice. So two product people agreeing to read the same book and then to discuss what they think about that book. That's a book club, that's a community of practice already to some extent, the smallest version of it. And then oftentimes there are more colleagues around that do product or do similar things. And I think it makes sense, or that's what I observe with my clients, the ones that are having these communities and that nourishing these communities, um, really the product people develop over time and learning new things and frameworks. Um, and that's beneficial for the companies because, let's face it, sending people to a conference is expensive. But sending fewer people to a conference and then them letting bring the insights back to the rest of the product organization may be already cheaper. And other things um, that help, it helps product leads with their calendar usually, because, for example, some community of practice deal with all the onboarding of new product people. So then it's not only the line manager responsible for the onboarding, right? So a lot of potential, but I don't see a lot of product companies run a vital product community. So that's something that I think needs um, to change a bit. And it's rather simple to do this if you focus on the human to human connection, which is hard for all of us to do after this COVID pandemic. Um, but it really helps if we get in touch with each other and say like, hey Fabrice, I really struggle to understand how I should be using the strategy template. So can we have a joint whiteboarding session? Or, hey, I just saw this super cool talk at this conference and I think it is helping us with this particular problem. So let's try it together and then have a session in four weeks to share how it was helpful or maybe not. Um, and these kind of things, holding each other accountable on their learnings, I think this is and that's why they're important. And how you start them um, is really by finding learning headlines that are more, peop more than one person is interested in, and then think about how you could learn something new. So is it by consuming? Is it by applying something in your daily work? Is it just by reflecting how an initiative was going and then sharing your learnings? Um, and I think that is the first thing. And then a lot of companies start build a learning backlog. So what is everybody interested in? A client that I'm currently working with that really started small by, hey, everybody seems to be interested in jobs to be done because we have been at a conference, thrilled about the talk that somebody gave. Um, now let's come together, everybody tries it, and then we come and see how it helped us. Um, so don't overthink it. Just start small. And then the next layer definitely is that the company has to decide if they want to nourish that. So is there a budget? Is there a sponsor? Um, can they bring external speakers? All these kind of things. But that's step number two. First is the people learning with each other and from each other. And should, who should take care of that? Because I see more and more people uh, having product ops, for example, uh, in their companies. And product ops is a bit of a multi-dimensional um, position. I don't think that product ops are doing the same thing from one company no. to the other, yeah. um, which is good or bad thing, I don't know. When it comes to this, having someone say dedicated, because as a CPO, to, to, be, to be honest, I created one at the fork, and we have three hours every two weeks, but I don't have time to animate it. Yeah. I just don't have time. Um, so who should take care of that? Who should be the one or the ones actually making sure that, well, you have people mm. coming, that you have people saying, I'm there, I'm not there. Follow the progress of people. Do you have yeah. any, any, any tip in a way? Yeah, definitely. So I think it helps if you think about the purpose of your community of practice. So is it learning with each other and from each other, or is it bringing in external stimulus? Or what are you doing with this community of practice? At one of my clients, the sole task of the product community of practice, and you could argue if this is a good idea, but the only thing that they do is they own the skill framework for product people within the organization. Super interesting. So it's not HR or the product director owning that. It's all the product people together thinking about what are the skills and capabilities that we need to be successful. Interesting take on a community, right? So they're not gathered that often because they just revise this every once in a while and that's basically it. But if your purpose of your community is sharing and learning with each other, maybe that's the purpose, I would assume, um, then you might want to 
find a good rhythm that works for everybody and find various rituals that work for everybody. We want to think about the more introvert colleagues and the more extrovert colleagues and the ones that maybe want to use Slack message to align with their colleagues and the other ones that want to really meet and mingle and hug people. Um, so that's, that's all the things that we want to consider. And then one goal should be, how do we make it self-sustainable? And that is a question that the community can discuss. And I haven't found at one of my clients that the community itself is not able to come up with a solution how to make itself sustainable. Some like to do take turns. So you maybe start it, but then everybody in the community of practice agrees on, okay, I'm organizing the monthly meeting in May, and then another person does it in April. So that's often what they come up with. Um, in another um, of my clients, they have, they, they call it community champions. So it's always a defined group of five people or six people. I don't recall, um, that are actually, for the time being, organizing community events. And then maybe later in the journey, there can be different people joining this board of people curating for the group. Yeah. But don't make it a too hierarchical thing, because it should be a community thing. Yeah. There's one thing when you talk about community in your book, which was surprising, really, really something that I, I learned, I hadn't thought about it, which is having what, what you call the uh, shared community of practice. So communities that you share with other companies. Yeah. Um, can you tell a little bit more about it? Because for me, that was really surprising. Uh, so I learned something from your book, at least one, yeah. apart from the fact that I'm not, maybe I was not a strong product people, but that's <laughs> the other learning. Yeah, so, so this is a shared company across community of practice, right? So everybody's coming from different backgrounds, different companies, and we're sharing what we learn. That's one thing that I love about the product community. Even when you're competitors, sometimes the product people still talk about, hey, that's how we do story mapping, how are you doing story mapping, or something like that. It's what I really love about the product community, because everybody's really sharing. Um, but what I saw um, not massively often, but especially, for example, in uh, I consulting some, some companies in the Scandinavian area of Europe, and some of them are in highly regulated markets. So they decided to have a community of practice about how do we do user research in highly regulated markets. Because it's not so easy to just go out and approach your customers for, hey, can you, you can't meet them at Starbucks and say, like, can we have an interview, right? Um, so they have created this community of practice that is solely trying to solve this problem for all the product people in these companies. And I think there is a lot of beauty in that, right? Because it, there is an actual problem, and they're actually having all these conversations about how can we make it work, what works for you, what doesn't work for us. Um, and they, they really came a long way, so it was really surprising what they found and ways how they could still get their user insights. So as, as product people, I, I don't know how many of you uh, participate to recruitments, uh, but we are supposed to be, at one day or another, involved in recruiting our peers or our managers. And it's never easy to find the right questions, the right ways to make sure that we have a strong product people in front of us, or that people that could be, become strong. Um, and there are plenty of books saying, yeah, this is how you should phrase the things, don't do this, do that. Um, but I think its product is pretty special. Um, what are, from your experience, uh, the best things to do to detect this strongness, the strengths, or are there strengths people promising, in a way, that you show that they can become strong with the right coaching or leadership? Yeah, and it's actually, by the way, hiring is something product communities of practice often help with as well, right? To say like, okay, we don't want only the direct line manager to interview our new colleagues. We want more people to invite to this process. Um, and again, if you're inviting more people to this process, you have to have the conversation as a group of people. How do we measure competent in our environment is a competent product person, somebody who is able to manage a team for the time horizon of, I don't know, six to 12 weeks. And if we can keep the developers busy, we're good. Or are we looking for somebody who is more strategic, who can look 12 months out and to work with all the stakeholders and the 
profit and loss and the business cases and all these kind of things, right? So that's the first step, definitely, before you start asking the questions. And then groups of people get really better over time to really spot like, okay, this person is similar to the, the picture that we have in mind for a product pe a person. One thing that as a product leader, as the person managing the product people later on, you want to avoid is too much group thing because we all know we tend to hire people that are alike. But sometimes we need to hire what we often call cultural ads. So people that are bringing the culture that we want to create as leaders in the future. And that is something that is really hard to do for the people that are already with the company. So if you're in this situation, you might want to either talk about it with the rest of your team, if you like a really transparent company, or you need to do the hiring yourself and see if the cultural ad is actually given. Um, but good questions to spot. It's like always with all our user interviews as well. Tell me about a time is a really good starting point. So tell me about the time, the last time that you created a product strategy. How did you go about it? Tell me about the time when you last had a really conflicting moment with one of your team members. How were you solving this? So that really helps you um, and comes a long way. Um, because if I ask you, how are you shopping jeans online? There is a massive difference to how have you been last shopping at team uh, at jeans online? What have you been doing? What were the steps, right? Usually the answers are very different and I think the same applies for hiring. So that is a good question. And then I like everybody to brief them on the subtle parts. So is the person, for example, polite to all the people, even the person at the front desk in the company and more these kind of things? which are little indicators for their values and personality style stuff. So I think that's e equally important. Yeah. And what's hard, because I, I think we all have different ways of looking at it. Some people are doing business cases, some do there are don't. Some doing business cases on their companies, some do business cases on other companies. Yeah. Um, which som sometimes is a bit weird. Sometimes you have, the, as a candidate, the impression that you've been doing some work for the yeah. others for free. I tend oh. to avoid this as well. It's, but yeah. uh, what are the worst things to do? Actually, the things, okay, stop doing this. Definitely stop doing this when you hire people because either it's misleading or you, you will not detect strong people, product people by doing this. I think that is, again, a perfect pref preference of the people hiring. But for me, it always was, so I need to get them in front of a whiteboard, can be a digital one, of course, but I need to get them to work. I want to see how they wired, and I just want to see if they could work with the people they might end up working. Sometimes you do the hiring before you actually know where to put them. Um, but still, I always expose them to parts of the team, and I always want to, to see how they're solving problems. So I create cases that help me with every, in every situation. Um, as you were saying, it's weird if you put them on a task that the company is currently having, because then it's like, I'm working for free for this company already, and they haven't even hired me. So I tend to avoid that, but I think you can come up with some cases. I share several one of them in the book, um, so that you could use to see how they're working together with the rest of your team. And then I said, if you have a compass, your definition of good, what are the skills and the know-how that a product person needs in your context, rather easy to do the hiring. Because then you have a blueprint and you only, ha only have to compare um, the applicant to the profile that you're having. So I think it's important that there somewhere is a skill definition in written form somewhere, even if it's on the back of a napkin, as long as everybody interviewing is aware of that. Okay. So, so that's okay. what we need to do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned uh, the role that managers or leaders have in terms of coaching. Now, they are don't know for all of you, but I know in, through my careers, uh, I sometimes had managers that were not coaches at all. Uh, and I didn't feel they were helping me become stronger. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What do I do? If I'm in this situation, even uh, as a CPO, okay, I don't have a CEO. When CEO is, is a sales director initially, so he doesn't know anything about product. So how can I grow? 
Yeah. So that's a particular challenge with leadership, right? That's kind of it's lonely at the top, Fabrice. Um, but still, you could go to events that are catering for other product people, CPOs. There are some events out there. I always think it helps to find peers that are at a similar level and just hang out with them. And um, it's a bit like what Bruce said about the stakeholder management, right? So if you cannot physically hang out with them, then give them a call or a Zoom or whatever. Um, but it helps to find people that have the same ambition to learn something new um, and are kind of at an equal level career-wise. I really think that helps to find these people. Um, Gibson Biddle, former CPO of Netflix, he wrote a tweet ages ago about how to find a mentor. That's another thing that is a good idea. So find somebody who is not super, super senior, but a bit more senior than you currently are, um, and ask them if they would be willing to mentor you for some point in time. I think that's even that's a great thing to do, for, by the way, if you're more on the senior end of things, then mentor a junior person. Because by sharing what you learned, you really experience your mastery to some extent. It's really uplifting and like, oh, I really know a lot about this product stuff. That's actually really cool. Um, because I said, we often feel this, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, but helping others to learn the ropes of product management sometimes even helps the most senior people. So I think it's a win-win if you find either a mentor or a learning buddy or a community like this. Oh. Yeah. By the way, I'm not doing my advertising, but for those who know French produits, there are crews there when you can actually have other people, all the peers like you. It's completely free because French produit is free. Uh, so you join Slack and you can find people like you. So doing my advertising part. Yeah, uh, it's of good. The, of the but French that's exactly community. what we want to do, right? So if somebody says like, hey, I'm reading this book, who else is joining? That is a really nice way to learn about people that want to learn the same things than you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, more and more people choose now a career in product, which is very weird for people that have been in product for so long, because we ended Why up... Would they? Yeah, exactly. We ended, we ended up being product for, by luck, or I don't know if it's luck or, or bad luck, but... I was just a really bad developer, yeah, okay. actually. Um, <laughs> what would you say when, if people want to join, or they just, we are boot camps like uh, No Way, Maestro, for example, in, in France, um, and it's, it's starting to be really a thing, but it's always hard when you're starting in a new, a new role to find the right musculation to start with. What, what would be your advice for people like this? That is such a hypothetical question because it is really... So start where it makes sense for you to start in your current context. Because if you get lucky, you get assigned to a product really early on in your journey, and then you learn whatever you have to learn to keep the team entertained and to bring the product forward and to cater for user needs and all these kind of things, right? So it's not that any of us have deliberately chosen the things that they need to learn. So I find it really hard to tell people where to start. I think you start with the things that you need to learn to deliver the job. And equally important is taking, learn to take some time kind of aside to then reflect on what you have done here. I think this is actually the biggest trick. Um, and then don't get too stressed out by all the others reading all the books, because basically nobody does. Um, it's, I just have a coach, he says like, I'm now on one book a year. That's my decision. I read one book a year, and then for 12 months, I really try to understand it, to apply it, and understand why the author wrote what they wrote, and then I turn to another book, and I'm just like not looking at all the other things. Because let's face it, there are a lot of books out there, um, and all of them have great value to offer, but I think it totally makes sense to focus on your personal learning, what is helpful for you right now, have these conversations with your line managers or peers, and then stick to it, really just like building a new habit. It needs some time. Be gentle to yourself. Um, not everybody is a super quick learner, and sometimes the environment is just not really supportive with that, and then takes it a bit longer um, to learn new things. But yeah, that would be my tip. So whatever helps, and then take some time to reflect if that was good. Okay, last question. This is the optional one. 
if you had to do write something more, something different in your book, because there are always this kind of guy, it's never perfect, it's a product by definition. What would be the extra thing that you would yeah, like to add so that the audience can have this little bonus? <laughs> On the book? I think I, so how I'm positioning the book is it's a book for people that are already in product leadership. And I think if I would be able to do it again, I would m slightly change the scope to say like, hey, it's even for people who are aspiring product leaders. So that is something that I actually uh, would like to add. And I would talk more about this community approach of learning because I haven't done this. So the, product, uh, the book is all about direct line management responsibility and coaching. And um, the piece that is missing is really the community piece. So that's another book that I have to write on oh, product communities of too practice. Bad. Too bad. <laughs> you will have to come back to LPC. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you a lot, Petra. <laughs> and uh, so for you to know, so yeah, applause. Okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Thank you. I don't, never first switch your users. Yeah, you know? I don't. Uh, so of course you can buy a book on our website. And talking about books, Tristan Charvia will be now doing some uh, autographs in his uh, book, Dis Discovery Discipline, at the booth of Tiga Academy for the next 30 minutes, I guess, or 15 minutes. So if you want to have this, you can go there. Thank you a lot, and enjoy the break. <laughs> Thank you. Off we are. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>